Good evening, everyone. Some of you may uh, know me already. I'm Rabbi Barry Schwartz. I'm the director of the Jewish Publication Society, and I'm delighted to welcome you actually to the sixth lecture uh, this year of the new JPS Skirball New Author Series. I want to begin by once again thanking Temple Emmanuel and the Skirball Center for Adult Jewish Studies for initiating this series. We have launched this series, I, I might say, with, with great acclaim and are, are deeply benefiting, I think, from uh, this partnership, which we hope will continue for many years to come. Uh, on behalf of Rabbi Davidson and our uh, acting uh, director of the Skirball Center, Mark Weistuck, who are both occupied with a board meeting of the synagogue on the fourth floor uh, this evening. Uh, we want to welcome you. I've told we also have fairly big competition in that Henry Kissinger is speaking at Central Synagogue this evening. <laughs> However, I think you're going to learn more tonight. <laughs> and I'd, I'd like to thank Sarah Siegel, sitting in the middle, um, in the back, who works with me at the Jewish Publication Society, and Jennifer and the entire staff of the Skirball Center that works very hard to accommodate this series while sponsoring many wonderful courses. How many of you are familiar with the Jewish Publication Society? That is good for those few hands that did not go up. We are the oldest. Jewish publisher in the United States, having just celebrated our 125th year. We're known for our acclaimed translations of the Tanakh, of the full Hebrew Bible, and for many classics. For example, one of our classic compilations called Legends of the Jews, which began in 1909, has been in print for more than 100 years. There's not that many publishers that, that can uh, say that. And I really want to tell you that the individual who is speaking tonight is speaking about a new book, which is a small piece of his work, because Professor Michael Karasik has been working for how many years now? 13 years and counting. 13 years and counting on one of the most significant projects in JPS's history, which is the translation of the Mikraot Gedolot, the classic rabbinic commentary on the Torah, the commentary that includes the medieval luminaries such as uh, Rashi and Sephorno. One man, this man, has taken upon himself to render this service, and I want to tell you that when I travel around the country, when I travel to rabbinical conventions and to Bible conventions, more people come up to me with the question, when is the next volume appearing, than any other question. Because uh, this great translation of the classic rabbinic commentary is being used to open up a new world for rabbis leading Torah study and for teachers in the classroom. Michael Karasik is four-fifths of the way completing that project. We have published the Mikrot Gedolot to Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. Deuteronomy is in production. And Michael has saved the best for last with Genesis, which we expect will be published in 2017, 2018. How he found the time uh, during that massive undertaking to do other wonderful writing is a source of great mystery uh, to me, but uh, we have benefited from his new book just published called The Bible's Many Verses. And if you Look at this book, you'll see that you're in the presence of a master teacher and someone who wants you to 
learn the Bible and love the Bible and recognize that you can revere it as scripture at the same time you can appreciate the deft hand that is responsible, or hands I should say, for the literary voices, the historical uh, voices, the poetic voices, the legal voices that make up the many voices of the Bible. Michael Karasik is an adjunct assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, which means that any time we have a meeting, he just hops on his bicycle and cycles across town. That is his, I guess, his major means of, of, of transportation. I know that he also teaches at the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College, which is located in uh, Philadelphia. He's taught at other places, earned his PhD at Brandeis University. I consider Michael Karasik in the world of Jewish writing and scholarship to be a national treasure. I'm gonna make that designation uh, for him, yet he is a humble and unassuming and just like the Jewish Publication Society, he is mission driven. His mission, if I can state it, is to bring us to a great appreciation of the book, the book of books, which is the foundation uh, for Judaism and the Jewish people. Uh, let me just add, uh, before I close, not only uh, how delighted we are that Michael Karasik uh, is, is speaking, uh, but that you have supported the JPS Skirball series. We will conclude it next month. The, at the end of the month, there's a flyer in the back when we have Ruth Calderon coming from Israel, the Talmud scholar, the rising star of the Israeli Knesset, unexpectedly elected to the Knesset uh, this past year, speaking about her new book, which JPS has been fortunate to publish as well. So thank you for your support, and I present to you Professor Michael Karasik. I speak too long, you're gonna give me the high sure. Thank you so much, Barry, for that amazing introduction. And uh, let me just say before I begin, if I can make it up here from Philadelphia, I'm also going to come to hear Ruth Calderon because she has a reputation as an amazing woman and an amazing teacher. And thank you all, of course, for coming and joining me tonight to talk about the subject that I love the best, the Bible. Have you ever said to anyone, how are you? and they tell you, that's how this book got started, okay? There's actually a character who does this in the Bible. An angel shows up, uh, it's near the beginning of the book of Judges, Judges chapter six, to talk to a man named Gideon, and the angel greets him the way you would have done in those days by saying, the Lord be with you, mighty warrior, and instead of Gideon saying, thanks, and the same to you, pal, he says, what do you mean the Lord is with me? The Midianites are attacking and the whole situation is a disaster. And he goes on and on. And he has eventually becomes the person who leads Israel to victory. Well, I didn't lead Israel to victory. But what happened to me two separate times is that someone said to me, so what are you doing? And I told them what I was learning about in grad school about the Bible because the Bible was so exciting. I don't even recall what I was telling them in each individual instance, but I was so, you know, they said, how, how is it going? And when I shut up 15 minutes later, they said to me independently and separately, you should write a book about that. Okay, I finally have written that book. The book is The Bible's Many Voices. And the thing that is so, that was so exciting to me and remains so exciting to me is that the Bible isn't what I grew up thinking it was 
someone speaking in Bible English in kind of a monotone for page after page after page. Finally, the quote-unquote new JPS translation, the newest part of which I think is 30 years old now, but it's newer than the old translation, came out. And so you don't have Bible English anymore. At last you can pick up the Bible as if it were a book and read it, and it reads like English, and that's good. But it was all translated by the same kind of person at around the same time in history, and it's all more or less in the same language. And after all, it's the Bible, and it's just very easy to assume that we already know what's there because most of us have our experience not although we think our experience is with the Bible, most of us have our experience with Bible stories. How many animals of each kind did Noah take on the ark? Everyone knows he took two animals, a male and a female. In fact, if you read the Bible, it's a little bit more complicated than that. I will leave that for you to discover in the book. But the Bible story says he took two, and all the movies and the cartoons and the comics show the animals marching two by two into the ark. That's not what the Bible says. So there's lots of things in the Bible, lots of voices contending with each other in the Bible. I had a very hard time this evening trying to think of which of the many voices I could introduce you to and still get you off the street by midnight. So I won't be here until midnight, but I'm going to try to introduce you to a number of the different voices. One of the things that a lot of people apparently don't know, uh, a student of mine at the University of Pennsylvania was absolutely, uh, is there a word, hornswoggled? I mean, his jaw dropped open, and for the rest of the class, he was staring at me in amazement when he discovered that in the Bible, there are not just one place, not just five places, but many places, I would say an average of about once per page in the traditional Bible, in the Hebrew Bible, not necessarily in your tr translation, about once per page where there's one thing that's written in the Bible and in the margin is another voice saying, don't read that, read this. Okay. Almost everyone who's seen a Hebrew Bible at all knows that one of those replacement words is so automatic they don't even bother to tell you about it. God's name, which is spelled with the Hebrew equivalent of a Y and an H and a W and another H, which gave us the English pseudo word Jehovah, Someone wants to know about that extremely strange word which never existed in any language until it popped up in Europe a few centuries ago. You're not supposed to read that name, those four letters, out loud, even though that's what it says in the Bible. Instead, you read the Lord, or the Hebrew equivalent of that. And that's so automatic they don't even tell you about it. They assume you know that. But what about in the book of Kings? Uh, return with me now to those thrilling years of yesteryear, 701 BCE, when Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, has besieged the city of Jerusalem. And in another set of multiple voices that I don't have time to discuss tonight, there's at least two, maybe three different ways this siege is described in the Bible, and we also have the advantage of having Sennacherib's account of the siege, giving us an outside voice telling us about it. But one of the things that happened during that siege, according to the Bible, is that one of Sennacherib's guys who could speak Hebrew, or Judean as it's called in the Bible, starts calling to the people inside the besieged city and the king's advisors, the, since you mentioned him, I didn't realize he was my competition tonight, the Henry Kissingers of the day said to this Assyrian guy who may have been a northern Israelite, 
You don't have to speak Judean. You can speak Aramaic like normal civilized people do because we understand it. And he said, I'm not talking to you, Charlie. I'm talking to everyone in the city. I want them to hear what I have to say. And what he said to them was this, your city is besieged. There's no food and water coming in and out. You are going to end up eating your own excrement and drinking your own urine. Why not just surrender and we'll send in the pizza and beer? But the written text of the Bible does not say excrement and urine. The margin tells you those are the words you're supposed to say when you read this text. The written text inside the Bible uses the cruder words, which you can imagine that I'm not going to say in a sanctuary. So there's two voices right next to each other, one in the biblical text, one in the margin, one shouting and the other one shouting, no, no, don't say that, say this. Okay? And there's actually a number of such, as I say, an example about one per page of those, and very few of them are to keep you from saying a bad word out loud in the synagogue. There's all kinds of reasons that they do this, many of which I would say we don't understand today. One of the most common examples you find of that, written one way in the text and another way in the margin that you're supposed to read out loud, one of the most common examples is one that if you stop and think about it just as a matter of don't read that word, read this word, they wouldn't be any different. I'm talking about a Hebrew word Barry didn't mention it, but what I teach at Penn and at the Reconstructionist uh, Seminary most of the time is Biblical Hebrew. You can never expect to come to a talk by me and not hear a single Hebrew word. I'm afraid you're going to hear a number of Hebrew words tonight. Okay? The word you're going to hear first is the word lo. If you spell the word lo with a vav at the end, the vowel letter that signals O, it means to him or for him. If you spell it with an aleph at the end and the vowel is assumed, you still pronounce it low, but low with an aleph means no or not. And there are dozens of cases in the Bible where one of those two choices is written in the text and the other one is written in the margin. So they can't be telling you, don't read low, read low. Because even in biblical Hebrew, low and low would have been pronounced the same. What's going on behind that? We really don't know. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes, it makes an incredible difference in the meaning. So I have an example here from... The book of Job, Job 13, 15. Here's one that you've heard, uh, I would imagine, quite... Everyone in the room should be familiar with this. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. A famous line from the King James Bible, one of the many English voices that we encounter the Bible in. And let me put in a commercial for the King James Bible, even though it's not published by JPS. Of course, tied with Shakespeare at the top of the league table for the English language. Even Jews have to have a copy of the King James Bible on your shelf if you are English speakers. An amazing book. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. That's Job speaking, despite everything that has happened. But that's not what's written in the Bible. That's what's written in the margin. In the Bible, not low with a vav, in him, but, and this is the new JPS translation, he may well slay me. I may have no hope. So which of those is what the Bible says? I will trust in him or I have no hope? Answer, the Bible says both of them simultaneously. Okay, one of the two speakers says trust in him and the other speaker is saying 
no hope. Sounds the same in Hebrew. Now here's another example for you. Um, I'm going to stop and tell you for a moment about the Chicago White Sox. Okay? We scholars of the humanities never get a chance to do experiments the way scientists do. If you're a chemist, you can pour chemi- chemicals into the tube and you can try it again with different chemicals, different temperature or pressure. But what you can't do if you're a scholar of the humanities is change the historical conditions and rerun history to see if the Bible comes out differently. But as someone who has taught biblical history, a number of years ago I had a great experience when the Chicago White Sox played the Chicago Cubs in Chicago. What happens if you're a baseball team? The local newspaper has a guy who follows you around all season long and reports on every game. So in Chicago, the Chicago Tribune has a reporter that follows the White Sox around and has a a reporter that follows the Cubs around. When the Cubs play the White Sox, one of them does not get the day off. They both write a story about the same game. Who are these guys? They are both guys. And I saved, actually, a particular example. They're both guys, both presumably around the same age, same social class, exactly the same job, same employer, same geographical location, sitting in a space a little bit bigger than this room, but not a whole lot bigger, watching the same baseball game. And one of them said, anyone who knows baseball will know this is from a while ago, James Baldwin carried a masterpiece into the seventh inning and the relief pitchers lost the game for him. And the other one said, Baldwin barely made it into the seventh inning. It's amazing that the Cubs didn't have more runs by then. How could this guy have such a good record when he's such a bad pitcher? Okay, two people watching exactly the same event at exactly the same time, people of the same kind, same everything, and they saw it completely differently. And we expect the Bible, which, let me remind you, was written over a period of a thousand years from the 12th century BCE to the 2nd century BCE, They should agree on everything? Not going to happen. So let me give you another example of the many voices. And this is not exactly like my baseball game, but it's close. Uh, If Jeremiah and Ezekiel will forgive me for making that comparison. Jeremiah and Ezekiel, two of the three major prophets of the Bible, major in the sense that their books are long, as opposed to the 12 minor prophets, Jonah, Amos, and the gang, whose books are very short, not in terms of their importance. Jeremiah and Ezekiel were alive at the same time, at the very beginning of the 6th century BCE, just before the Jews were exiled to Babylonia. And as some of you may know, there was a preliminary exile to Babylonia, not the one in 586 when the first temple was destroyed, but in 597, the Babylonians kind of fired a warning shot toward Jerusalem and had a mini exile to show the Jews what was coming. And Ezekiel was in that mini exile. But other than that, Ezekiel and Jeremiah were reacting to exactly the same moment in Israelite history. And they say something each very, very similar until you look a little more closely and realize that they're very different. It's about the new heart that God was going to give the Jews. Let me read to you for a moment from a page in the book. It's worth remembering that each biblical voice is originally the voice of a single individual. 
and each is colored by an individual's upbringing, intellect, and temperament. We can see an example of this in the motif of the new heart, which is common to both Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Both prophets believed that sin was the cause of Israel's problems, and both believed that sin was a result of the nature of the heart, that is, the mind for which heart is the biblical image. Yet the solution to the problem, the change necessary to make the hearts of Israel amenable to God's will, seemed different to each of the two. For Jeremiah, the heart's ability to follow its own counsel is at the root of the problem. Once God's commandments are imprinted directly into the mind, obedience to them will be a matter of instinct and not a matter of choice. Here's what Jeremiah says. This is the covenant which I shall cut with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I shall put my teaching inside them and write it on their hearts. And I shall be their God and they shall be my people. No longer will anyone teach his friend or his brother, know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the smallest of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and no longer remember their sin. Okay? Remember those words. I shall put my teaching inside them and write it on their hearts. For Ezekiel, the problem is the exact opposite. You may be familiar with the story of the Exodus when Pharaoh's heart is hardened. I imagine you are, since you all heard about it quite recently. Hardening your heart in the Bible doesn't mean that you become cruel, but in Pharaoh's case, that his anger has made him so stubborn that he can't think clearly enough to save himself and his people. For Ezekiel, a mind that is fixed in its obstinacy must be made flexible enough to be able to respond to the logic of God's commandments. And here's what Ezekiel says. I shall give them one heart and put a new spirit inside you. I shall remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh so that they may follow my laws and keep my statutes and do them. They shall be my people, and I shall be their God. Don't ask me, because I don't know the answer, whether one of those guys was looking over the other guy's shoulder. You can hear they both say this prophecy from the Lord, they shall be my people and I shall be their God. When I give them a new heart... But the new heart that Jeremiah wants is firmware. Okay? Software that is going to direct, that's not changeable, that's going to direct exactly how you will follow the laws properly. Because right now you have too much flexibility. You think, oh, I want that, and I'll go do that, and you violate, and you sin. Ezekiel says, no. It's because you're not flexible enough. You're stubborn. You're obstinate. If you could just think clearly, which you'll be able to do when God gives you this new unencumbered heart, you'll understand that, to put it in a trite way, honesty is the best policy and sin is stupid. Again, two Prophets, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, I'm not pulling guys off the street to ask them their opinion, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, who both say, in this situation, and you have to remember, this is a situation when the nation is about to be destroyed by a foreign enemy. In this situation, number one, the problem is sin. Number two, the problem is you need a new heart but they're arguing about what kind of new heart you need. Another example for you, if I may. Another Passover reference. We've just read the story of 
How many plagues does the Bible say there were in Egypt? Ten plagues. Okay, everyone knows that there were ten plagues. How do we know it? Because the Bible told us so. But not if you read Psalm 78 or Psalm 105, poetic versions of the story of the Exodus, which tell us that there were seven plagues in Egypt. So what was it, seven or ten? And maybe it's seven if you watch CNN and ten if you watch Fox, or it's vice versa. I don't, I don't know how to judge that. Even the ten plagues, you can find all about this if you don't know it by reading Nahum, Nahum Sarna's JPS Torah commentary to the book of Exodus. The ten plagues are written in a very stylized three, three, and one pattern. It's not reporting. It's three, three, and one, literary framing of the ten plagues. So if a poetic version of the story tells us that there were seven, maybe the thing to assume if I'm a historian or I, I want to be back there with a video camera, what would I see? A lot of chaos. And the storytellers framed the events in a way that we could comprehend and decided to use these numbers, 10 and 7, resonant, magical sort of numbers, when what was really happening was a lot of people running around the streets screaming because of all the disaster that was happening to Egypt. But again, this is not something that scholars have discovered, that the 10 plagues didn't happen or whatnot. I'm telling you, if you read the Bible, you will find that here the Bible describes 10 plagues, and over on this page, the Bible describes seven plagues, two, of, two such pages, in fact. Let me take one more example, because I know at some point you're going to want to ask me some questions, or at least to go home. And if I keep talking, I definitely will keep you here until midnight. And I'll read the entire book to you, and I would rather that you buy it and read it on your own in the comfort of your own home. Um, but something else that... Uh, you all know about because there was a famous movie about it, the Ten Commandments. Okay? Well, there were Ten Commandments, even though it's a little bit more complicated than that. But the Ten Commandments occur in the Bible more than once, at least twice and maybe more, probably more, shall we say. Uh, let me add that I'm going to talk about the Sabbath commandment, and I'm not going to identify it as the nth commandment, because if you are a Jew or a Protestant or a Catholic, you number the commandments completely differently. When you read them, you'll see why. It's hard to get to a number of ten. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Sabbath commandment to introduce you to two more of the biblical voices. So here we are, and this, again, is... Uh, an example that's mostly from the book. It's a little bit adapted for me to read it to you tonight. And you can find it also on my blog, The Bible Guy. According to the storyline of the Pentateuch, God only spoke the Ten Commandments once in Exodus 20. But the book of Deuteronomy, which is essentially presented as a long farewell speech by Moses gives him the opportunity to recap the entire story of the Exodus and the wilderness wanderings. In the course of the recap, he retells the story of the giving of the Ten Commandments, and in Deuteronomy 5, he recites them again. In Moses' repetition of the commandments, they're naturally essentially the same as in the Exodus 20 version, but not exactly so. The most obvious difference and the most telling one comes in the commandment about the Sabbath. So let me read you now the Sabbath commandment from the book of Exodus, the actual event of the giving of the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day to sanctify it. Six days shall you labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. 
You shall not do any work, you, your son or daughter, your male or female slave, your animal, or the stranger who lives in your town. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Now here's the repetition from Deuteronomy 5. See if you can tune into the differences. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days shall you labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or daughter, your male or female slave, your ox, your ass, or any of your animals, or the stranger who lives in your town, so that your slaves may rest as you do. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. So there's a few minor differences in the Deuteronomy version of the kind that are found in the other commandments as well. For example, as the Lord your God commanded you is added because Moses is repeating what the Lord said in Exodus 20. A couple of animals are added, specific animals are added to the general rule that even animals shouldn't work on the Sabbath. The more telling differences are a tiny but crucial one right at the beginning a small addition in the middle, and then the large different at the end. Let's take them in order. The first difference between the two versions of the commandment is that in Exodus, the Israelites are instructed to remember the Sabbath day, while in Deuteronomy, they are instructed to keep it. Some of you know the song L'Chad Odi that Jews sing traditionally on Friday night, one of the lines in that song is, Shamor vezahor bedibur echad, which essentially means, and this is how the commentators in the commentator's Bible explain it, God spoke in stereo. One channel said, remember the Sabbath, and one channel said, keep the Sabbath, and it played simultaneously. But... I'm here to tell you that Deuteronomy changed the Exodus word specifically because remember serves a special purpose in the book of Deuteronomy. The word remember serves a special purpose. It's always used only with historical events. In Deuteronomy, the Israelites are frequently told to remember what had happened to them, but are never told to remember what God has told them. They remember events, but they keep God's commandments. Apparently, the distinction was made in order to distinguish two different kinds of knowledge, things that were seen that you can remember and things that were heard which you can keep in mind. Most of the Bible is not interested in this distinction, which depends upon a fairly sophisticated understanding of the human mind. But Deuteronomy is. So remember of the Exodus text was changed in the repetition to match Deuteronomic psychological terminology. When you reread the book of Deuteronomy with the awareness that Deuteronomy is thinking about psychology, you will notice it on every page. The second quite significant change is the addition to the long list of those who must be permitted to rest on the Sabbath of a clause emphasizing that on this day, rest is not just for the masters, but for the slaves as well. The Exodus version of the commandment already makes this entirely clear, but in Deuteronomy, the addition seems to serve a kind of rhetorical emphasis insisting that the commandment involves not just a day of rest, but a day when all people revert to their original equal status. Moreover, the emphasis that slaves must rest provides the justification for the rest of the verse, 
the Deuteronomic explanation of why the Israelites must observe the Sabbath. The Exodus version of the Ten Commandments indicates that the special status of the seventh day of the week comes from the blessing that God granted it when he finished the work of creation. God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, for on it he Sabbathed Shavat, he Sabbathed from all his work that God created by making. Now, the explanation that the Israelites must observe the Sabbath because God blessed that day does not say so explicitly, but it also implies something more. By Im- that observance of the Sabbath is an aspect of what theologians call imitatio dei, imitation of God. By imitating divine behavior, the human beings who, according to Genesis 1, were created in God's image, can conform more closely to the divine model. In this case, since the process of creation involved not merely six days of labor, but a seventh day of rest, they, like God, must work for six days, but then rest on the seventh. Moreover, it would seem that according to this explanation, the world was actually constructed in such a way that resting on the seventh day keeps one in tune with the universe. Sabbath is cosmic. The Deuteronomic explanation is quite different. As we've seen, Deuteronomy adds an extra clause to the commandment, emphasizing that slaves must rest equally with their masters, which makes the subsequent explanation of the commandment much more logical in context. The subsidiary commandments, not one of the Ten Commandments, to remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt amounts almost literally to the insistence that each individual Israelite have a social conscience. This explanation presents the Sabbath commandment as inextricably tied up with the Israelites' experience in Egypt. Implicitly, God's redeeming them from slavery provides, one, the justification for his issuance of new commands because he's their new master, and they're instructed to renew their awareness of their experience of changing masters every seven days, and they're instructed to be aware that people have to rest on the seventh day because work is hard. Now, I'm going to interrupt the Ten Commandments. I'm coming to a close quickly, but not immediately. I'm going to interrupt the Ten Commandments for this commercial message from the book of Genesis. If you've read the book of Genesis, Parshat Bereshit, you know that the story of creation is also told in two different voices. One, a voice that says, God saw that it was good, there was evening and there was morning, day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. And if you read what happened on those days, it's the theory of evolution. It's the evolution of the solar system and the evolution of animal, plant and animal life. It's very, very scientific. And in fact, if you know anything about ancient Near Eastern science, they were trying to match the best scientific knowledge of their day. Then all of a sudden, God blesses the seventh day. He rests on the seventh day. He blesses the seventh day. And there's a brand new story about creation, which has a guy and a gal and a snake and a tree and a lot of dialogue, and emotions, and anger, and upset, and it's a story about people. It's not science. It's a movie treatment, okay? When you see the cartoons about the story of creation, 
There's no cartoons about Genesis chapter 1. The cartoons have a tree, a guy, a gal wearing no clothes, and a snake, and an apple. Uh, those who listen to my podcast next September will understand that it wasn't really an apple, but I'll save that for then. What's the difference between those two stories of creation? The same difference that we just saw in the explanation for why you have to rest on the Sabbath. Exodus, it's cosmic. Deuteronomy, it's about people. I'm not here to tell you that one of those explanations is right and the other one is wrong, but I am here to tell you that both of those explanations are biblical. And as you'll see when you read the book, there are many other ways of approaching the world that still matter to us today that the different biblical voices were already contending with. I'm not going to give you the entire rest of my Ten Commandments spiel, but I do feel obligated to remind you all that the words Ten Commandments, even the Hebrew words for Ten Commandments, don't appear in Exodus 20 when the Ten Commandments are given. They appear with a set of commandments that's given in Exodus 34. And those commandments are quite different from the commandments of Exodus 20 slash Deuteronomy 5. I'm not going to read them all to you, but you shall keep the festival of unleavened bread. For seven days you shall eat matzah. Six days shall you labor, and on the seventh day you shall rest. In plowing time and harvest time you shall rest. You shall make for yourself a feast of weeks. You shall not slaughter my sacrificial blood with anything leavened. Oh, yes, and the conclusion of this version, you shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. And the Lord said to Moses, write down these words, for in accordance with these words do I make a covenant with you and with Israel. Moses was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He ate no food and drank no water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, Aseret Hadibrot. That's where the Ten Commandments are called Ten Commandments, not where the Ten Commandments that you see on the courthouse door are given in Exodus 20, not where Moses repeats them in Deuteronomy 5, but here in Exodus 34. Stop one of these politicians who are so in love with the Ten Commandments and ask them to recite the Ten Commandments as they are in the Bible. If any one of them launches on Exodus 34, email me immediately. All right. I'm going to finish up now and open the floor to you for some questions. But first I have to say, is Sabbath cosmic or is it social and personal? Are the Exodus commandments the Ten Commandments, the Exodus 20 commandments, or the Deuteronomy 5 commandments? Or is it the Exodus 34 commandments, the ones that are called the Ten Commandments? What is it that the Bible says about those things? What does the Bible say about the plagues of Egypt? Were there 10 or were there seven? The answer to all of those questions is yes, because there are many voices in the Bible. Even in this book, I've only had the opportunity to introduce you to a very, very few of them each of these chapters could be not just a whole book in itself, but many books. And I'm hoping that after you read this one, you'll have to find another book about the Bible and join me in the adventure of learning about this incredible, 
ancient volume that still speaks to us today. Thank you so much. Okay, I know that JPS is eager to sell books to you, and I'm eager for that too, and I'll be happy to sign them, but I know people have some questions. I see a question here. I'll come to you in a minute. Please. Yes, thank you. It's very, very interesting. I have your Wonderful. Oh, it's quite natural, of course, that there are discrepancies. Right. So what is the problem? Why, why don't people realize this? For one thing, almost all of us read the Bible in a translation that sounds like it's the same voice all the time. Number two, there are people that feel, these are not just Jews, but Christians as well, people that feel that this is a holy book and it can't contradict it itself, even though I can tell you that the traditional Jewish prayer book says, early in the morning service, one of the things that you have to know when you're interpreting the Bible is that, uh, let's see, when you find two verses that contradict each other, you have to wait and find a third verse that resolves the contradiction. So we know that there are contradictions. The question is, how do you deal with them? And there are people who want to resolve everything so the Bible is a single coherent voice. And others like me who are more excited and I would say who find more religious value in the fact that there are many voices talking to us. So... Yes, you're absolutely right that this is the natural way to look at the Bible from my perspective, but not everyone does. You had a question, yeah. Right. Right. What theological virtue could there be in a book that doesn't have internal consistency? Why didn't someone put together a book that has consistency and that makes sense as a coherent whole? Especially a holy book, a book that's sacred to the Jews, a book of Torah, whether written or oral. Oh, for example, the oral Torah, the Talmud. The Talmud in which Rabbi so-and-so says that you can only start saying the evening Shema when the stars come out. And the other rabbi comes in and elbows him away from the microphone and says, no, you can't say the Shema until people sit down to eat dinner. And there's 10, and there's ten different explanations of when you can do this. And when you stop and think about it, and the Talmud acknowledges this too, all of them are exactly the same time or within seconds of each other. What's going on? One set of voices in the Talmud is saying, the evening Shema, why do you have to say Shema in the morning and in the evening? It's cosmic. Daytime, nighttime, the cycle of the seasons and of the solar system, Another set of rabbis is saying, no, daytime and nighttime, this is how we live. We wake up in the morning, we go through our day, and then at night we go to sleep. And that's what the Shema is about. So the fact that the Bible has that exact same argument exactly at the beginning of it, the same way the Mishnah and the Talmud do, I don't find that to be a problem. Yes, sir.
Okay, I appreciate that. Um, but I would say something a little bit different. I'm not saying that all the voices are valid, as you suggest, because I'm not sure who I am to validate the biblical voices. I'm saying you can hear them all. They are there. There's different voices in the Bible. And there certainly are voices in the Bible, some of which you'll read about in the book as well, which the Bible thinks, and I would guess I, I, would guess I have to say I also think are invalid. For example... Jeremiah, who I talked to you about a few moments ago, I told you that Ezekiel uh, was sent, was exiled to Babylonia, but in the chaos that followed the destruction of Jerusalem, Jeremiah was essentially grabbed by a group of Judeans and dragged with them down to Egypt. You have to remember, of course, Babylonia and Egypt, the two superpowers that were fighting over Jerusalem in those days. And they get him down to Egypt, and they start ragging on him and saying, you know why all this happened? And he said, yeah, it's because you guys were not worshiping the Lord the way you're supposed to. And they said, nuh-uh. It's because your pal, King Josiah, made us stop worshiping the Queen of Heaven. And she's mad, and she destroyed Jerusalem. Okay, is that a valid voice? Um... I don't want to insult anyone's religious beliefs, so I don't want to say that it isn't. I don't really think so, but, and I don't think the Bible thinks so. But it's there, and that's the point for me. That's what's exciting to me. We can hear the people who said in biblical times, who said directly to the prophet Jeremiah, you are so wrong. All of this happened because we stopped, you made us stop worshiping the real God, the Queen of Heaven, the powerful God. And I wouldn't have known about that. And that's an amazing thing to know, that there were people in Jerusalem who thought the thing you had to do if you wanted to survive was worship the Queen of Heaven. Ma'am, someone in this row, was it you, ma'am? So if you'll permit me, right, right. So if you'll permit me, let me emphasize something that maybe I didn't um, emphasize enough at the beginning of my talk. This is not one of those books that's written to prove to fundamentalists that they are wrong. There's a book called why Evolution is True, that's written for exactly that purpose by a professor from the University of Illinois. Great book, if you don't know it. Why Evolution is True, all kinds of amazing facts that demonstrate evolution must be true. And he thinks, he's completely wrong, but he assumes that a religious person will read that book and have a spiritual conversion and say, now I get it, evolution is true, and I was wrong. That's not what my book is about at all. And in fact, I'm perfectly happy. I'm excited for fundamentalists of every persuasion to read this book. They will find very little in it to argue with. One or two things, but mostly I just say what the Bible says. I didn't write this book to prove to fundamentalists that they are wrong. I, I totally agree with your perspective, but that's not everyone's perspective. I wrote this book to say, this is the most interesting book that has ever been written. You have access to a thousand years worth, very selective, but a thousand years worth of arguments, 
ideas, great poetry, which I barely touch on in this book that has to be the next book that I write after I'm finished with Genesis, okay? Great, great poetry that you have to know Hebrew to understand, but I can convey it to you in English. All kinds of amazing things and individuals that you will meet. Let me toss out a tidbit to you that I don't know anything about other than this. Miriam. You all know who Miriam is, the sister of Moses and Aaron, mentioned many times in the Torah. You know how many times she's mentioned after the Torah? Once. Once in one of the prophets, and I have to apologize, I don't remember. I think it was Hosea, but... Don't print it until you check it, Hosea, Amos, where one verse says, God tells the Israelites, you lowlifes, I gave you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Why are you always complaining to me? Okay, so in the time of the prophet Hosea, the idea was God gave us Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, or one person had this idea, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. The window opens just enough for us to see Miriam being mentioned in the 8th century BCE, if I'm remembering correctly where it was, and then the window slams again, and that's all we know. It's frustrating, but I'm a lot happier having had that one peek through the window than not having any at all. Do you have a question? Yes. I tremendously appreciate that question. How, how do you go about doing what I do? There are actually um, at least two places in the book where I do a little bit of it, and then I give you the opportunity to do some of it on your own. And one or two other places where I say, if you want to do something on your own, here's what you do. And when you read those parts of the book, you will see exactly what I've... I've said, and I point you to the next place. And when you read that place, you'll understand that you have a question and you have to think about it and read about it. Another way to approach it, uh, if you can't have me by your side all day long, uh, there are people who employ me as a person. There's one person who employs me as a personal Bible trainer. Okay? My beloved wife who has helped me and supported me while I'm trying to do this work, who's responsible for everything that I publish. But you all can't have me that way. You can have me 10 minutes a week if you listen to my podcast. You can follow my blog. But suppose you want to do exactly that and start doing biblical research on your own because everyone who's read the Bible at all has questions. What do you do? Let me offer a little commercial for a book called The Commentator's Bible. Why the commentator's Bible? Because there you have at least for the books of the Torah in English two things that you need in order to do this kind of work on your own and to get started on doing it. The first thing you have in the commentator's Bible is not one but two English translations. If you read one translation you think that's the Bible. It's not. The Bible was written in Hebrew. If you read two translations, every once in a while you will read along and you will find a passage where once you learn how to distinguish King James English and JPS English and see that they're really saying the same thing most of the time in a different level, a different, what's the word, a different register of language, Every once in a while you get this verse that I started out my talk with from the book of Job. Though he slay me, King James, he may well slay me, JPS, 
Okay, they're reading the same Hebrew, they're explaining it the same way, even though the words are a little different, but yet will I trust in him, or I may have no hope. Okay? When you read two English translations that go like that, then you realize there's a question in the text that you have to ask. And people write commentaries, people have explained this stuff and argued about it. I'm not telling you which one of those is right or wrong, but you know where you have a question and you know where to follow a thread. The other thing that the commentator's Bible gives you is not one, not two, but, and not three, but four and even more, and in Genesis there will be a fifth guy on the page, commentaries telling you what's going on in the Bible, and the commentators are going to disagree. Not 21st century university commentators. I'm talking about the traditional Jewish kosher commentators. Rashi will say, well, it's X, and Nachmanides will come along and say, what an idiot. It's the complete opposite. The Talmud says the complete opposite. How could Rashi say that? Okay? And when you see the commentators arguing, there's another place where you understand there's a real question in the text. And uh, some of you may know this, but some may not realize it. Even though the medieval commentators had a, had a lot of ideas, that, um, ideas about the text that not everyone shares anymore, they did think that the Bible was a coherent book. And I think that it's less coherent. But you will find that a surprising number of their questions are completely modern, even if the answers aren't always modern. And even the answers sometimes are. So that will get you started. Yes, sir, please. How could I not? It's not an easy thing to do, and you do it so well. And Thank I you. How in the course of the, the 13 years that you've been immersing yourself in verses for Rob, with the commentator part, where you're essentially looking at four commentators <coughs> ex post facto trying to see it as a, a whole, how it's and then you write this book, which explicitly recognizes the multiple voices, which is very different from all the time spent. I'm so glad you asked this question. Okay, how do I reconcile these two completely different sides of my life? the traditional commentators of the commentator's Bible and the modern academic study of the Bible that the Bible's Many Voices is based on. There's a very simple answer, and then because I like to talk about the Bible, I'll talk about it a little bit more than that. The simple answer is the people who wrote the Bible wanted to get their message across. They want it to be understood. Rashi and the other medieval commentators also wanted their message to be understood. And my task as a scholar and as a Jew and as a lover of the Bible is to take anyone who's connected with the Bible and who has a message to get across that I find interesting and worthwhile is to convey their message to you if you can't see it without my help. Okay? The slightly larger answer to that question is, who are, to name the big four of Exodus through Deuteronomy in the commentator's Bible, Rashi, his grandson Rashbam, Abraham ibn Ezra, and Moses ben Nachman, Nachmanides, all from the 11th, 12th, 13th century. So long ago, the, the high Middle Ages, almost a thousand years ago now. These are guys who do what I do. 
they read the Bible and they try to understand it and they explain what the Bible is saying. Who am I going to want to spend my time with more than four guys who love the Bible the way I love it and who want to talk about it? And now, if you'll permit me one more paragraph answer to that question, and I think probably we have to, have to stop at this point, but I'm so glad this question got on the table. Let me tell you for a moment about something I heard in Baltimore last November from a scholar named Peter Machinist. He's an extremely renowned Bible scholar from Harvard University. And he was talking about cleaning out his parents' house after their death. And he found a photo album. And he's turning the pages of the photo album. Oh, and there's Aunt Sadie, and there's Uncle So-and-So. But he saw lots and lots and lots of faces he didn't recognize. And there wasn't any longer anyone he could ask to tell him, who is that? And he realized part of what's driving him in his work of understanding the Bible and the wider ancient Near East <coughs> was this. Those people are all now dead. They no longer have anyone to speak for them. And he said, what a terrible crime it would be if they died twice. I don't want Rashi to die twice. I don't want Nachmanides or Abraham Ibn Ezra, who can hardly afford it, to die twice. And I also don't want all of these mostly anonymous people who somehow managed to get, as the old joke has it, they got a page in the Old Testament, okay? You know the joke. Moses, if you can split the sea in half, I'll get you two pages in the Old Testament, okay? These are people who got into the Old Testament. That's the Christian term. You'll read in the book why it's not a Jewish term and how different the Old Testament and the Bible are. But the people got their voices heard, but not everyone can hear anymore what they're saying. And I want those people to be heard. That's my job. You called it my mission. There's a Hebrew word, of course, as you know, for that. That's my tafkid. That's my assignment here in the 21st century is to let Rashi and Rashbam and all of the Bible's many voices be heard again. And I'm so looking forward to inscribing the copies of the book that you will all buy in a moment. Thank you so much. <laughs>